Hello everyone, and welcome to our second part of the sci-fi tutorial. We are going to continue where we left off. In case you didn't know it yet, there is also the possibility to download the tool Chop Suey at Point Index. This tool basically does exactly what we worked out in the last part of the tutorial. It actually has the same settings we built ourselves. That is, we can change the iterations, set the position of the cuts accordingly, and of course the angle at which the polygons are cut. To do so, go to pointindex.de and download the tool there. I can also add a link in the description. In the second part of our tutorial, we will look at the different elements we can use to cut our shapes out of polygons. For this we must use a relatively large for loop, because we want to run on every polygon. Then you need a poly extrude node with which we move our polygon a little to the inside. This is to create more space for further working passes. Next we need a delete small parts node, which deletes the smaller polygons. This is because we don't want to work with them and use them later. After that we must create a convert line so that we have our individual curves to work with. Next we need an attribute wrangle because we will write some code. And we want to select the largest curve. Technically, the workflow at this point is not much different from last week. We look at the length of our spline and compare the maximum to promote and extend this attribute to a new class. We then give this attribute its own name, for example max len in this case and then compare this with all other rest length values of our other curves, so that we can say if we want the longest spline or the other ones. Of course you can take the codes directly from the previous Wrangler, and copy them over, or copy them directly from all the nodes. Every now and then I like to rewrite them as well, so it's easier to remember. We then change the class to primitives, so that the whole thing can run over our curves. We specify here that we only want all curves except the biggest. And don't make the mistake, and forget to click the little Make a Channel icon on the Delete Smaller Attribute Wrangle, and set the value 4 in. I will face that issue later on. The next step is to create a for each loop for primitives. Then we need some center point. Again I am using my own snippets here to save time and effort. We also need some normals here and do it with a polyframe node. We fuse these points and make a centroid from our Delete Small Parts node up here like that. In the wrangle, we create our own axis to get some normals that point always to the center of our object regardless of the point number of our curves. So we get the center position and our points positions, building a z-axis that we use as a proxy to use that in the cross-product function. This will enable us to find the correct y-axis to get the correct z-axis. I understand it's a bit confusing, but it will all make sense in the end. That's great. Now we'll have the normals always pointing toward the center. I am also creating an upward vector, and copy these two attributes over to our fused point. To use a predefined shape, we must first check if our polygon has enough depth. That's what we do in a subnetwork. Connect the first input to our center point, and the second to the converted lines up there. Dive in and copy a curve to our point, and check if it intersects with another curve here. And as we can see the line is not copied over in a 90 degree angle, that is due to the fact that we are missing some normals, so let's fix that real quick. Go up one level and check the first input. We actually need the attribute copy, and not the fuse node to provide us with correct normals. To have always enough length, we can grab a value from our initial polygons to have at the very least the biggest reference in our project. We do not want a curve so short that our curve is too short to detect intersections because we need them. Using here again the intersect analysis works best to provide us with two points. We will then connect the points, make a curve, and measure it again to determine the depth. Let's make the reference rest length to have always enough curve to intersect. As we have already done a couple of times, let's make a bounding box here and check for the longest edge. If you want you can grab my tools on point index at any time. If not, just copy over the nodes we made last time, compress them into a subnetwork, and you should be able to extract the longest edge with some adjustments. Measure the curve with a converted line, dive back into our depth checker, and type in an expression to get the rest length of our biggest curve of the project. Don't forget to put an output node in here because otherwise when you move up the context, it will only show you the node with the display flag on it. With the output node it will always display the last node, regardless of where the display is active. Now we can test our checker with our switch node that will only let our box copy to points with enough depth. Otherwise, it gets an empty null for the first input. 
The way it works is that we put a condition directly in here and say compare the rest length of our checker if it is greater than 2, which is another static value. If it is, it will return true, or in computer terms 1. If not, it returns 0, and magically switches our inputs. Nice, we copied boxes to some points. Now we will build our cutting bool shapes. We need to create a subnetwork and dive in. The way this works is by offsetting the position of a shape that I am building here right now. That offset is driven by our curve's rest length. To illustrate that, I made some masterpiece sketches for you. We will basically draw a triangle in the end, where two points are overlapping. Then we take one edge, and move that by the rest length value divided by some ratio, and hopefully we are getting a cutting shape that we will use to bool out our sci-fi in-cuts. The first thing I do is making a plane, adjusting the size a little bit, setting rows and columns to have a clean plane, rotate the plane to 45 degrees, and bevel one point to get a nice starting edge to work with, match axis, and model the basic shape out of a plane. This is our approximate shape, which we have to give an individual length to. I use a clip and a transform node with a slight offset in the X scale for points 1 and 2. Here are a few moves that are not really procedural, but we don't need to be procedural now. It is more a honky way to model the shape I want in the end, and offset the points I need in such a way that I can then apply a transform and move just two points of one edge and have always the correct length of my shape. So in the end I end up with a reverse triangle from which I can always move two points in a positive direction. So I go up one level, get a null to connect it to our nested for each loop, where we call the rest length from, dive back into the subnetwork, and reference in the x-axis from our transform to get the length we need. I invert the values to move the points into the positive. To not having the shape exact the same length as our edge, we can divide it here by a ratio that you like. I chose 3.5 here. Then we take another transform and copy and paste the values from the transform above, negate them to move the other points back to finally center our object. I guess you can use a match axis for that if you want. To have a bit more control over the length and not have them exact the same length as our curves, we can make us an input on our subnet. We can copy and park the reference like that in another transform, and paste the actual expression into our rest length reference. Great. Now a little cleanup, and an extrude that has some value. A peak for a slight adjustment, a match axis for alignment and an output in the end. We get perfectly aligned and sized shapes after moving the peak node halfway back. You could introduce a random value to get more rest length variations, but I am too lazy for that. Let's cut something out. Yeah, looks cool. Now the longest edge is not processed at that time. We will treat that differently. We have one issue here. It looks like one of our delete small part is not working correctly. However, it is actually our own wrangle where we forgot to make the channel that limits the length. Due to the dimensions I put 4 in, and it works now. Now let's make another branch and work on the biggest edge we have. The way we prepare that is the same way we did for the other ones, so you can just copy them over like I did. Let's bring the centroid into an object merge to have our loop a bit more organized. Just wire everything up like on the other side. Bring another object merge in, and make the convert line a reference. And we need to test depth again, just in case. Bring another null in, as well as another switch here. Just update the name in the expression of the new switch, and paste the name of our second depth checker. We make two different copy to points, one for the shape, and one for the grid of tubes that we will also use to bool some cool hole in the exact same place where we will bool our shape off. We can work and expand our dynamic cut in that way. You can already test it when you get another bool, and we will be able to see immediately that we need some changes. Let's wrap this up for today and continue next week with the holes grid and finish our sci-fi panels generator.